Henry Wallace character. And he kind of reminds me of uh, C.L.R. James. Somebody said of uh, the Trinidadian Marxist C.L.R. James. I th- it might have been Christopher Hitchens. Is that one of the things about James is that he got all of the big calls right of his time. He was a fighter against imperialism. He was a fighter against, obviously, the colonial order, the capitalist order. Then he was a committed Marxist till the day of his death. But he also... Um, had a critique of Stalinism um, at a time when it was, you know, it was an actual, like it was a, it was a real debate. So, and Henry Wallace, especially for a guy who got to be vice president, and I was saying in the opening of the show that I listened to probably 20 years ago when I was a teenager, an interview that Christopher Lydon did with a former Iowa senator about Henry Wallace, and it blew my mind as a kind of like World Bank protest kid that someone like this could be vice president of the United States, that he was, you know, not um, not triangulating in terms of uh, segregation. He was a fierce fighter against apartheid, Jim Crow America. He wanted to extend and enhance and was influential in Roosevelt's great advance in terms of uh, the, the sort of extension of the Bill of Rights, new uh, economic Bill of Rights but also fascism, imperialism, colonialism. How did this guy fit it all together? What was like the underlying worldview and commitment that made him get so many calls right? It's a really good question, Michael. And you know, one thing that I do emphasize in the book is that Wallace didn't get everything right. He made mistakes. Uh, One of the greatest things about him was uh, his ability to acknowledge those mistakes and to discuss them. He was an incredibly open, man. He was glad to talk to anybody, debate with anybody, and he was very prepared to engage at the highest level. When um, Henry Luce, uh, the publisher of Time and Life, wrote a, uh, uh, an essay on what, or talked about the American century, um, Wallace came back with the idea saying, no, no, this should be the century of the common person, the common man, the common woman. And uh, and really battled. He loved to battle on ideas, and it wasn't. It was never personal with him, or very rarely. It was. It was about trying to get to the right answer. Now, here's the interesting thing about him. He had a couple of experiences that are highly significant. As a, a child, really, he was uh, drawn into a lot of agricultural work. And George Washington Carver uh, was someone he met as a kid actually revered. And so growing up in in rural Iowa, he had African-American heroes. And um, I think that had some some influence on him along the way, Uh, especially where he turned out to be so far ahead of the curve on on issues of race. Uh, But he also was a devout Christian. Uh, He was very, very um, moralistic, if you will. And so there were moments where he faced tough questions and was, which side do you go on? Do you go uh, on the side of exploitation? Do you go on the side of fairness? Um, He made the call to go to take those tough choices and they hated him for it. They literally despised him for it. They called him a communist uh, because he was willing to work with communists, even though he was actually by, by any measure, he was a capitalist. Uh, There's no doubt about it. He was just a very moral capitalist. Um, this is a guy who's a successful capitalist, very successful. I mean, yeah. Like personally a successful capitalist. Yeah. As, as is often the case, right? The people that are really good at it, they actually understand how to do it. Um, aren't as, uh, as desperate and as scared as so many of our wealthy people today are. Um, mm-hmm. but, but he would be embarrassed by whatever wealth he, he attained. His real focus was on, you know, fundamental issues, solving big problems. And the interesting thing was at one point he was interviewed and he was asked, you know, what are what are books that have influenced you? And this is literally, I believe, I hope I've got this right. I think it was, you know, right in during the vice presidential campaign in 1940, going into his vice presidency. And and he said, yeah, you know, I've read the Bible and Marx, you know. <laughs> and so the, the interesting thing is he was really open to uh, a tremendous amount of ideas and at the end of the day, with all of that said, mistakes that he made, strengths that he had, um, he went to a set of fundamental premises, and that was economic and social and racial justice 
preservation of the planet. He was a conservationist. And uh, avoiding wars, doing your best to avoid wars. If you had to fight a war like World War II, fight it for moral purposes to beat fascism. Uh, but don't just go around the world looking for wars to fight. That's, that's, you pretty much sum the guy up with that. So, John, what was the establishment's reception to Wallace? <laughs> Boy, did they hate him. <laughs> they despised him uh, really from the start. Roosevelt brought him in in 1940 uh, because the New Deal coalition was huge. This is the thing to understand. Roosevelt won massive victories, and Democrats today like to say, oh, wow, the New Deal coalition. But what they don't always recognize is that that coalition extended all the way from the most scorching, awful racists in the South over to militant socialists. It included bankers and civil rights leaders. You know, so you had this this coalition that was always hard to manage, always stretching and pulling against itself at times. Roosevelt could hold it together, but he became increasingly concerned that the um, as we were heading toward World War II, that the Southerners, the bankers, the more conservative forces within the coalition were really a burden um, and a challenge to or getting the country pulled together to fight against fascism. And so he replaced his sitting vice president with Henry Wallace, who was the most militant member of his cabinet. And uh, it was a clear move to the left. It was at a time when Roosevelt was starting to talk about the four freedoms as he was moving toward talking about an economic bill of rights. And um, Wallace came in and he did not pull his punches. He, he kept pushing for a progressive vision. And really what tripped it all up for Wallace, why the establishment you know, went to the mat to, to pull him down, was that uh, in 1943 in the United States, we had a, a series of race riots. The histories of World War II often try to portray the United States as very, very united. In fact, uh, the United States was pulling at itself. It was, it was straining in this very difficult moment. And um, because A. Philip Randolph and other civil rights leaders had succeeded in getting military industries, war industries integrated, um, there were forces that were trying to uh, disrupt that, that were trying to, uh, again, pull at that. And you did see a rise of racism, uh, violent racism, and not just in the South, but in Northern cities like Detroit. And there was a race riot in Detroit in 1943. Henry Wallace got on a plane, flew immediately to Detroit, and appeared within days of the race riots at a mass rally in front of thousands of, an integrated rally of thousands of trade unionists, mostly organized by the UAW and more militant unions. And he said at the start of his speech, we are fighting in Europe against folks who divide people along lines of race and religion and ethnicity, and that is evil here at home. If there are people who divide us along lines of race and religion and ethnicity, they are practicing, and I quote him directly here, Americanized fascism. And so in 1943, he made the connection between racism and divisiveness along lines of race, religion, class, and ethnicity uh, as an Americanized fascism. At that point, the establishment pulled out all the stops. The New York Times condemned him. Uh, the bankers went wild. The Southern segregationists were ready to get rid of them anyway. And they, in, by any measure, it's just, it's a big story of the book. They pulled him down. But it is a lesson in how when a visionary tries to move the Democratic Party in a progressive direction, uh, there are very powerful forces that will come together and try and stop that. Can so, you, oh, sorry, Anna, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a follow up to it um, because I think that his story is something that we can certainly learn from. And uh, the effort to destroy him and what he wanted to accomplish uh, seems to have worked. And he seemed to have given up on the Democratic Party, something that um, many voters who have aligned themselves with the Democratic Party for decades are now, you know, also thinking. So you write in your book, Wallace made the work of his rivals easier. He gave up on the Democratic Party and in 1948 mounted a poorly thought out, ill-timed, independent progressive presidential bid, while the threat that Wallace's candidacy uh, <clears throat> posed 
would briefly pull Truman to the left, it failed to pull many votes, and it gave Wallace's detractors an opening to unleash a furious assault on the man they portrayed as clueless and calculating, marginal and dangerous. I mean, it, it's incredible how much history repeats itself. And I, I feel like, you know, there are elements of, of what you wrote there that we're experiencing today. And I just wanted you to comment on that. Absolutely. Well, you know, this book starts in 1942, 1943, amidst World War II. It ends uh, in the summer of 2019, uh, back at, at uh, Wallace's farmhouse, the place where he was born. I went there with Bernie Sanders in August of uh, 2019. And, you know, look, uh, I don't see history as having beginnings and ends. I think that most of the fights that were fought are still being fought. There are new fights to be fought. We learn things along the way, but we often fall back into the traps. And so what I would say in answer to your very good question, Anna, and we could take it as far as you want to go on this, is that kind of the core point of my book is to understand that there are visionaries who arise at particular times in our history, not just Henry Wallace, but other folks, Ron Dellums in the early 1970s, George McGovern as well, Jesse Jackson, Shirley Chisholm, we can run down the list and they fight for the soul of the party. And so frequently they are marginalized and beaten down, beaten back. Um, and we need to understand that. We need to understand that that reality exists. It has existed. And so then the question is, um, do you go out to try and create a third party? That is a credible action that great men and women have taken in the past. And sometimes it has had success. The greatest success was when um, socialists and radical abolitionists and uh, land reformers got together and created the Republican Party in, in 1854. Um, and so it can be done, right? You can do it. But the lesson of Wallace, and frankly, a lesson that we get a lot along the way is, if you don't do it with enough power and enough energy at the right moment, you run the risk of uh, being welcomed to do it by power. Power says, yeah, yeah, go out and make that, make that other effort. Go do that other thing. Because our system is so gained against third party, fourth party, multi-party democracy, that um, it, it's almost as if a, a switch is flipped, the machine goes on. They're like, oh, okay, somebody's doing this, um, here's what we'll do. We'll make it hard for them to get on the ballot, harder than ever in a year with coronavirus and, and social distancing. We'll keep them out of the debates. We will change the debate rules however we have to, right? Um, we will then, at the end, uh, literally beat the hell out of them in our media, right? Like 20, if you thought, if you thought Bernie Sanders got a hard time in the uh, late stages of the primaries on, on American media, which I think he did, um, you should take a look at what they did to Wallace in the last weeks of the 18, or 1948 campaign. It was stunning. They pulled everything they could out. They had, he was, he was a communist. He was a, uh, a, a guru following spiritualist. He was a dupe. They he sounds had, cool. What? Those he all was, sound cool to me. I love it. I know, but this is the a best. communist with a guru. This is my guy. Michael, you're going to love this the best. <laughs> One of my favorite attacks on him yeah. was 60 years old when he was running for president, right? And he was in incredibly good shape. He was physically, you know, very athletic. He awesome. played tennis and that. They attacked him for being healthy and in good shape. <laughs> it's man, amazing. Man keeps himself in good shape. What's up with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's, so, what's going on there? I know. So the reality is, here's what he was attacked for. The ideal candidate. Well, he had his imperfections, trust yeah, me. Yeah, I know. I'm right about that quite a bit. But here's yeah. what he was attacked for. For not wanting to have a Cold War. For not wanting to have a Red Scare. For not wanting to let racism continue for not wanting to let sexism continue, for not wanting to have deep class divides in this country, for wanting the United States to get on the side of anti-imperialism and ending colonialism, and for trying, trying to build out a world 
uh, where the military and industrial complex wasn't the dominant force in U.S. foreign policy. And he was, boy, they, they hated him for that. Um, and you know what? They will hate anyone else who comes forward and tries to advance such a vision, be it you know, any time along the way right up to today. And my book is only, only the first part of my book is about Wallace. The rest of the book is about how this, these patterns repeat and what we should learn from them. But my message on what you ought to learn is that uh, you have to know the fight you're in. And if you're going to fight within the Democratic Party, you have to know that you're fighting for the soul of the Democratic Party. You're not, this isn't some little squabble, right? It's not a family feud. The forces that want the Democratic Party to be a centrist, center-right, neoliberal, neoconservative party, those forces will never give an inch. They're going to fight with everything they've got. If you're going to fight within the Democratic Party, you have to fight that hard. And with that kind of passion, it requires building movements in. It requires strengthening trade unionism, et cetera. And here's the core thing. It requires progressive Democrats, when they get power, if they do, right, if you break through and you get power, to use that power immediately on behalf of the movements and the coalitions that brought you there. That was what Roosevelt understood for all of his imperfections and all of his flaws. That is what Wallace promised to do in the aftermath of World War II. And my belief is, had Henry Wallace been elected, he would have implemented a massive housing program. He would have been implemented a massive jobs program. And instead of Democrats losing power in 1946 in the Congress, which they did, and then you got Taft Hartley, you got you know the beginnings of the Red Scare, the whole bit there, we could have gone a very different direction. Well, that keeps repeating. 1976, Jimmy Carter gets elected. Two years later, Democrats have severe setbacks because Carter didn't act boldly enough. 1992, Bill Clinton gets elected. Two years later, Democrats have huge setbacks. Again, I would argue because Clinton backed NAFTA and did a, a weak health care reform, et cetera, et cetera. 2008, Barack Obama comes to power with a great majorities and frankly, with, I think, a pretty good vision on a lot of stuff. And then um, because you kept kind of pulling back on things and, and doing, you know, I think, moderate things that tried to pull the Democratic Party together. You ended up in 2010 with massive setbacks that undermined the rest of the tenure. My bottom line is this, you know, if you're going to fight for the soul of the Democratic Party and if by chance you win it, you better govern from a standpoint of, of using your power rather than just sort of, you know, being a little better than the Republicans. Yeah, I, I, and I think uh, crucially, too, that in addition to letting, you know, basically just recapitalizing Wall Street without any accountability and then a convoluted health care plan, you know, Obama didn't push for card check, which was the last thing that I could think of in terms of a, a big fight for a piece of labor legislation that was like on the mainstream media agenda that was campaigned on and then completely jettisoned and, you know, still should be something that's pushed forward today. I, oh, yeah. 